Hey, all right. Good morning, everybody. This is Barnyards and Backyards Live. I'm Jeff Edwards for UW Extension. My co-host, Jeremiah Vardaman, is also from UW Extension. Good morning, Jeremiah. Morning. How are we doing? Or good day. I guess it depends good on day. when you're watching this, right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Our guest today is Worry Means. Good morning, Worry. Good morning. Good to have you here. Glad you could take time out of your day to be with us. Worry is the former Extension Meat Specialist. And uh, we will be talking about game and getting game and hopefully processing game. But in a minute, uh, first, let me go through uh, some rules for our attendees. If you're on Zoom, uh, if you have a question for us, please uh, use your mouse and scroll over your Zoom screen and either enter the Q&A button or the chat button and uh, put your questions in there and we will get them pushed on to Wari. And if you are watching via Facebook Live, go ahead and use the chat box and uh, we will pull your question out of Facebook Live and get it to Wari as well. So, um, Wari. I think we're good. Although, although I, didn't, uh, I didn't introduce Jenny. Jenny is also with us, Jenny Thompson from UW Extension. Uh, she is the keeper of the program and keeps us on task. So uh, you may not see her, but you might hear her. So welcome, Jenny. Welcome, Maury. I'm going to turn the program over to you and um, uh, tell, us a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. And it's good to be here. And Jeremiah and Jenny, thanks for having me. I... Um, I got excited about meat science uh, during my master's degree and did a PhD in meat science. And I've always been, grew, grew up in the family. We hunted deer and antelope. And so I've continued that sort of tradition you'll see here in a minute. And um, a lot of the principles and the science that I learned about meat for domestic species uh, applies directly to game species. And so I've, I've, uh, I don't know, for several decades probably been teaching hunter safety and talking to people about game meat and how, at least my ideas on how best to care for it and to process it. So I'm excited to be here uh, and talk about game meat. It's kind of getting me uh, in the mood for October. I've uh, uh, brought in my hunting schedule so I can get some days marked off my calendar and I need to do that right after this show. But we Perfect. can start. Uh, I have some slides we can take a look at and certainly I really enjoy questions and probing into areas that the audience might be most interested in. So if there are those, we can stop at any time and address those. Sure. Perfect. No, this is going to be great, Ori. And I think this is a great lineup because we've, uh, the last two weeks, we have uh, talked about uh, canning and preserving our produce from our gardens. We talked, as you know, with Cody Gifford about how to process and make cured meat. And so this is just going to go right along with our, our preservation of our food uh, coming into the fall. And of course, perfect timing, right? Hunting season is just starting in certain areas and really the bulk of hunting season is coming up. So this is gonna be fantastic. All right, well, we'll get started here. Let's see, get the right screen I want. So this is a presentation I give at Hunter Safety. And so if there's any questions and we wanna diverge from this, well, let's do that. So be sure and ask any questions that you have. Um, uh, this is my son about 16 years ago. This is his first elk with his grandpa's rifle. And so that's kind of a tradition in our family. And the first thing I want to talk about is there's ideal care and then there's what's practical. Because we're not in a slaughter plant, we're not in the meat lab, we're not, we don't have a cooler, most of us in our garage. And so, you know, over here on the, on the right and, uh, these are, these, these are some lamb carcasses and um, they've been slaughtered in a slaughter floor. It's very clean, there's lots of water. We use hot water, 165, 180 degree water to sanitize the carcasses and we roll them in a cooler and they cool properly. 
but that's not what we're doing out in the field. I mean, I mean we, can, we can see here, this is a Kansas white-tailed deer, uh, and, and all, of the, all of the nice trophies that you might see in my slide set, I did not shoot. Just get that out right now. And, but this is a lot different uh, than what we have in a processing plant. So I'll be talking about what's ideal and then some, in some ways how we can kind of approach that in the field. First thing, you know, I want to do is choose a healthy animal. And this slide always reminds me of that old Roger Miller song, you can't roll a skate in a buffalo herd. Um, but uh, in this case, you could kind of pick and choose what buffalo you wanted to shoot. And we did this for one of my classes. And actually, the owners of the buffalo shot it, and then we processed it in class. And, you know, often this isn't really possible. You don't have a lot of time sometimes to choose a healthy animal. But if you do happen to shoot an animal that does not appear healthy when you start field dressing or taking a look at that animal, you need to contact your, the local game warden. And a lot of times they'll give you your tag back or something to try to try to make it right. But they also want to know any kind of diseases or anything that's happening. And then you need to do that pretty soon, right, War? I, th I think you need to do that before you leave the site of the kill kind of scenario because once you've tagged that animal i think the tag is is done so make that call sooner than later yeah i'm not sure i mean <laughs> if i leave it i tag it because i yeah yeah you know, if i miss it if i don't get it i don't get it but right and i have done that before and uh, it's not i don't know you're right though so you want to shoot in a vital area and this kind of this picture here I mean, it shows the vital area. Uh, this is a gunshot. Don't pay attention to that because that's <laughs> not in the vital area. Remember I said I didn't shoot any of these, right? And uh, we want to get the lungs and, and or the heart. And actually the heart in this animal would be about right here. Uh, I don't usually try for a heart shot because then you're getting close to being too low. Right. And a long shot is good because it gives you a larger area in which to uh, make that shot. So if you're, there's a little bit of air on distance or wind or, or your own shooting ability, then a long shot is what's preferred. A long shot is what's advised by uh, Wyoming Game and Fish. Um, the head and neck shots, uh, I mean, I've done a few of those. They're more risky. I've also seen animals, and my friend shot an animal that the jaw was shot off, and that animal was going to die a slow death uh, if if we hadn't have, have killed it. So it's just a smaller target, and you don't get the whole head because if you don't hit the brain or the spinal cord, that animal's going to leave, and you might not you might not be able to retrieve it. Right. The neck. It always looks bigger than it is. Once you get the hide off the neck, it shrinks down and it's not gonna be as big as it, as it looks. So the best shots are in the vital area. Um, well, especially on that neck, the, the, they're, the vital parts that would actually be lethal to the animal are really, really small and really hard to hit and to define where that would be on the animal. That's correct. And Jeremiah, if you just take your hand and make a fist, the vertebrae in an elk are about that big, maybe a little smaller. You got big hands, I'd say. Like <laughs> and you know, you need to hit the vertebrae the or you hit the juggler vein right right on each side, or your the animal is gonna get away. So it's not the greatest shot to choose. And I've seen once and I've heard of another story where uh I saw a, a nice big mule deer shot with a 270 in the neck and hit the vertebrae and the deer went down, but then it got up and it ran off. And mm -hmm. when, when it finally got the deer and skinned it out, it had just barely chipped a vertebrae, which shocked me. But I think the neck gave enough when it hit that it didn't break that vertebrae. I would have thought it would have smashed the vertebrae. And then another a 30 caliber on a moose in the neck and the moose took off so there, that's a big heavy boned animal there yeah so yeah but if you would have got a good lung shot either one of those they would have taken off but they wouldn't have gone very far right right 
okay? The Texas heart shot, uh, as we call it in Wyoming, uh, or the hindquarters, I'm embarrassed to say I have shot animals there and I've always retrieved them because they bleed quite a bit. And to be honest, uh, you don't ruin as much meat as you would think um, because if there's, a, there's one bone, the femur, and if you hit it, you ruin a little more meat. But uh, if, when you shoot through the shoulder, you might even ruin, ruin more meat. So I wanna say one thing that sometimes I do when I'm, if it's near the end of the day, and I wanna make sure I get an animal down as I shoot a little bit forward so I break some bone so I can put the animal down where it is. And it depends on the caliber gun that you're shooting already. Two, gut shots are not ideal because then you get that contents of the paunch inside the animal. But I can tell you that I have never field dressed a gut shot animal that I have detected any kind of flavor on. Hmm. But I'm very particular and when I take it out, I try not to spill it and I will rinse it with water or water bottle that I have and try to keep it clean. Uh, if I'm shooting, we'll talk about skinning later, but cooling as fast as possible, that's, that's, what, you, that's what you wanna do. And sometimes uh, when an animal is not exactly perpendicular from you, you can have a good shot between ribs four, five, six, and it'll angle back and it'll actually go through uh, the paunch. So that happens quite a bit, I think. Shot selection really makes a big difference. And, and probably this fits into your ideal versus practical, right? And getting a good broadside shot into those vitals gives you as best you can in field conditions, a cleaner carcass to handle and process, right? Right. And I think it's really important that you know what your rifle will do and what your bullet will do and how it behaves. Uh, I shot a cow elk one time and I made very sure that I didn't have anything standing behind her because I shot her with, I have a 35 Whalen, which is a, uh, essentially a 358 6 and that bullet, at least half of that bullet will go through that cow. And I didn't want to wow. shoot the spike that was standing behind her. So I had to wait. And, and those are kinds of things you got to kind of consider depending on what kind of rifle shooting, what the bullets, how the bullets going to behave uh, when you're in the field. And sometimes when you're excited, it's hard to think about all that stuff. Right. This is just uh, a slide I have. This is a Hopefully not in Wyoming. The deer. <laughs> but I, my point here is, you know, let's follow the rules and let's only use legal methods. Not, don't use too small a caliber. Uh, just, they're there for a reason. They're there to protect the wildlife. They're there to protect people. They're there uh, so that uh, we can have a sporting chance. And I, I think this is important and something that I always try to do. Um, so I think that would be a twofer if the gator was the game animal you were going for. Yeah, maybe. I mean, don't train your alligator to hunt deer for you. That's <laughs> so these are some slides up at Seville Canyon Wildlife Area. The, the Tom and Tom Thorne and Beth Williams Wildlife Area, and like I mentioned, I didn't shoot these. Um, and this is a, a nice big bull. And we'll show a little bit later on him. I'm gonna show a couple pictures on caping this animal. So we'll talk about that. Um, he's a little bit, uh, he's been dead a while. They actually shot him one place, threw it, put him on a trailer and hauled him up to this place where I, they videoed and took a lot of pictures of, of the process. But the first thing you wanna do, of course, is make sure the animal is dead and I've, made a couple of mistakes <laughs> doing this. And I actually had an antelope that tore my pants once because I walked up to cut its throat and it came up. Its back was broken, but its front legs were good. And I also had a mule deer that came right at me and tried to get me with his horns, which was kind of exciting because I walked, was going to cut its throat. And then I shot it again, which is what I should have done in the first place. And it was kind of like bulldog and I grabbed his horns and I pushed him off to the side. But I don't want anybody to do that. So be careful. 
yeah. uh, and make sure they're dead before you walk up to them and start trying to field dress them. Um, then the first thing you need to think about in a processing plant is you need to bleed the animal. We stun it and we hang it up and we bleed it. Now, it's not always necessary with wild game because usually, and if you shoot a lung or heart shot, that's how they die. They die from internal bleeding. But I always do that anyway. To get any extra blood out, I'll slit the throat and cut the jugular vein, unless it's something that I'm gonna cape, which I'm not really a horn hunter, so I don't have that very often. So, uh, and you can cut the throat, which is what, what I do, um, I prefer that. Uh, you can do a brisket stick, it's a little harder, takes a little more uh, technique to do that. You can stick them behind the shoulder, but usually this is what happens, internal bleeding from the arrow or from the bullet. That's why the animal dies. So, but I'm, maybe it's just because I'm used to being on the kill floor, I, I do cut the throat so to make sure that if there's any other blood in there, it's going to come out. So what you're saying on that worry is that the animal's pretty much, if it had a good shot into the vitals, most likely it's bled out quite a bit. And that process, that doesn't mean you don't have to sl slit its throat to bleed it. If you wanted to do more bleeding, you could do that. Yeah, process. and you'll only get more bleeding if there's still some blood pressure, if the okay. heart's still pumping a little, or if you didn't quite get it all out. Well, and I was going to ask, I didn't know if, if you were on a, an ability on a topography where you'd need to get that head downhill to try and encourage that blood to come out the neck uh, of the jugular, or does that matter? matter? I okay. mean, the blood vessels are going to be, it's not going to matter unless you have some pressure. Right, and it, it's on that pressure. So if you slit that throat, the pressure will get that blood out and bleed it out for whatever is left. Yeah, and usually you get very little. Yeah. Unless you, it's a head shot and the heart's still pumping, you're really not going to get much blood out so bleeding that's what i have if necessary usually it's not necessary i gotcha. always do it it's a habit okay gotcha yeah you know. that's the first step in the process right right then field dressing and this is really important i think you need to field dress it as soon as you can because if you think about what you're doing you're removing all sometimes it depends if you skin it you're removing 50 percent of the animal's weight and take the legs off. And all that weight is warm. So it's 101 or three degrees, whatever the temperature of the animal is, something in there. And you take that away, then that obviously is gonna, you don't have to cool that and it's gonna allow cooling of that carcass at a much more rapid rate because it can cool from the inside and the outside. So we wanna field dress promptly. And I am a firm believer in removing all of the viscera. Because, and some people don't cut into the breast or the brisket and they leave the lungs or the heart and they don't cut the neck open and they leave the trachea and uh, the esophagus in there. I take all that out from the jaw all the way out, which you'll see in a minute. So we have the thoracic cavity, which is the chest cavity, the heart, lungs, the esophagus, trachea. And then that's separated from the uh, abdominal cavity by the diaphragm, which is a muscle and connective tissue that separates that. And the purpose of the function of the diaphragm is, one, is to separate that, those cavities. And two, as you breathe, if your chest, if you can feel your chest moving in and out, then you're, you're moving your diaphragm up and down. And when you move it down, you create a vacuum, your lungs fill with air, move it up and get, your, get the air out. So you, you need to cut around the body cavity and get that diaphragm loose so that you can, if the way I do it, I, I open up from the chin all the way back and then pull everything out towards the back. It doesn't have to come out in the bung area, come out to the side in front of the leg, depends on, like Jeremiah said, the topography. And you know, I've, Gut it out where you actually, first thing you do is you tie a couple of legs up to a tree because they're on a really steep hill and you can't really work on them because they're moving around down the hill. So you just kind of have to get set up first to do what you need to do. And I always try and position that animal if they're not already. I try and position them so 
gravity will help me bring this process and bring it all downhill for me makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah I try to get the head uphill if yeah. it's possible. Same thing. So worry it's that possible. that purpose of cooling them off as fast as possible is that mainly to slow down microbial activity or yes. something else? Exactly. And we'll talk a little bit about cooling, but uh, the internal parts of the animal, of a healthy animal, are essentially sterile. And so there's no microbial activity except inside the gut, of course, in the muscle, for instance. But as soon as we touch it with a knife and we open up the hide or we, our bullet goes in or the arrow goes in, we are contaminating that carcass. And it's really amazing how much hair, dirt, microbials, things that the bullet or the arrow will pull into the wound channel. And then, of course, when you're skinning it or gutting it, you're constantly contaminating it, even if you try to stay clean. I, I used to never use gloves, but now I always use uh, neoprene or some kind of gloves, and they're clean when you start. But if you grab a back leg, it's dirty. Right. And so you're contaminating it every step of the way. So the faster you can cool it, then the better we're going to be. That's, that's a good point, Jerry. And that's before we drop it and roll it in the dirt or, or anything <laughs> on the ground, right? That's just the process of doing this field dressing. We're, we're starting that contamination process. Right. As soon as you start to open the hide, or in this case, as soon as you shoot the animal, you're contaminating it. And if we... If we're as clean as possible when we do this, that helps, but you're still contaminating it. So you need to cool it off to keep the microbes from growing. They're gonna grow anyway, but the pathogens are gonna grow better at warmer temperatures. So if we can get it cooled down, we'll kind of keep those in check a little bit. Yep. The abdominal cavity has the rumen, which is a large stomach in uh, ruminant animals is why they can eat grass and digest cellulose. The microbes in there digest it for them. Large and small intestines, the kidneys, uh, liver, gallbladder. The gallbladder is something you probably don't want to spill on your meat, so take that out with the liver. And if you want to save the liver, then you can peel that off outside the carcass, I would recommend. Uh, the bladder, probably don't want to spill too much urine on your meat, um, so take that out and, and uh, if you can without uh, squishing it or squeezing it at all with the, with the viscera or anything so that it doesn't spew onto the animal. And then if it's a female, the reproductive tract, and, and sometimes we take with the male, the reproductive tract, most of it off beforehand. And I want to talk just a little bit about uh, proper equipment. Just drink the water first. I've seen a lot of people in the field that have really large, fancy, nice knives. I like to use, this is my favorite knife, okay? This is a four inch blade and it's a buck knife and I'm not doing an advertisement, but you need, in my opinion, a knife with good steel so that you can sharpen it. And you know, when I'm working in the meat lab, I just go next door and sharpen my knife and come out and work again. It's not that easy when you're up in the mountains with an elk or, or whatever you're doing. Usually I'm gutting my friend's elk instead of my own. Um, so these are the things that I carry in my backpack. My small four inch buck knife. And uh, it's pretty sharp and it's small. I know where it, that blade is all the time. When you're opening up uh, the midline and you have your fingers underneath so that you don't clip a gut under there mm -hmm. and I just know that blade is not sticking down in there too much and going to cause any problem. I carry a uh, small saw that I've used to cut brisket and the pelvic bone open, and it works very well. I've had this since my first hunting trip when I was 13, and it was a little long and wobbly, so we cut it down and cut the handle down, and uh, I don't know, it's kind of sentimental, but it still works, and it's very light. And I put that on my belt uh, with this little scabbard that my dad made me when I was a kid and uh, carry that with my knife. I usually carry them on my left side because so, I usually carry my rifle on my right side. And I don't want them 
planking around. And I'm a guy that, I'm not a minimalist. I always carry a backpack with stuff in it. Carry everything with you, right? Yeah, you know, like <laughs> summer sausage and cheese and water and coffee. Okay, a few, a few, few things I might need in the field. This is a diamond edge sharpening tool that folds up and fits in this little case that I carry in my backpack. And sometimes when you're working away, if you just take a minute and you sharpen that knife a little bit, get the edge back, it'll make a huge difference for you. So a lot I less work. When I'm, yeah, when I'm in the field. And it's safer too. And in my backpack, uh, when I'm elk hunting especially, I carry these things with me. Uh, a, larger, a larger knife, and that, I've been using this knife to bone out my game. And it works pretty well. I thought I wouldn't like it because the blade isn't flexible like we would use in a, in a meat lab situation. But we, we don't have the game on a table. It's not at the right height. It's, so I think that's part of the reason this works. And so what I do is I have for gutting the animal, I have a set of tools. And then for uh, taking the hide off and boning the animal, I have a different set of tools. And sometimes we, we bone it right away and pa to pack out on our back. If I've, if I've got the horse and I can bring him in, I just put the quarters on the horse and, and bone it out at home. But this is a little uh, skinning knife. This one, as I said, I use usually to bone out, to bone out the animal. And if I have to quarter it, I can use this saw. I prefer to use a regular meat saw. I'll walk two hours back to camp, eat lunch, have a cup of coffee, walk two hours back with my meat saw and a pack to quarter an animal uh, because it's so much easier than using one of these saws. And I, I know uh, there's those uh, Wyoming saws and all kinds of different tools and they work. I've used them. I don't have one, but I use my friends. They work. So if you have the right tools, you can do that. We'll talk about quartering in, the, in a little bit. But these tools down here are what we would use in a typical slaughter plant. So we're not too different. And because I have these, I bring them with me and they're at camp. And, and sometimes we'll shoot something, quarter it, skin it, quarter it, and elk, prop it up, let it cool, and then the next day go back and bone it. And I'll take my other tools to make sure that I have plenty of sharp knives when I'm boning. What I'm learning here, Worry, is you really need to make friends with either somebody that does meat processing or a meat science professor and take them hunting with you. That's what I'm learning <laughs> through this whole process. Well, I do do most of the boning, which I don't mind because then I don't have to pack out the meat as much. Right? <laughs> it's a good trade. <laughs> One time we were... I don't know. Do you tell stories in this? Sure, you can tell stories. Uh, we were hunting and I, uh, I shot a cow. Somebody shot a cow. I think I did. And uh, we, that evening, we skinned it. And I like to skin it and then quarter it and use the skin as a clean platform to do my work on. And then it snowed about a foot that night. So it was perfect. It cooled off well. And we had a nice clean snow to work on. So we went back and my two buddies each had backpacks and we boned it and bagged it and put it on my younger buddy and he went back to camp. It was like a mile back to camp. And then boned it and uh, put it in my other buddy's pack and he went back to camp. And then the first buddy came back, the young guy, and then loaded him up and he went back and then my buddy, who's my age, came back and I said, hey, sit down, you know, take a rest. He said, I can't. He said, I got to get going. He, Jeff's going to lap me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'm working away. Get the meat loaded up. I didn't load him as heavy as I loaded the, the young guy, of course. But, yeah. I use gloves. I don't always use these big rubber gloves, but some kind of gloves. And this glove over here is actually a Kevlar impregnated uh, cut resistant glove. And you hear about people that cut themselves hunting and there's even been cases of people dying if they stick their femoral artery or something or cutting a finger off. And I don't always wear those, but I have them, so I use them. 
And the other thing is that when it's cold and that meat's cold, it keeps your hands warm. You can work a little better right. that way. And like I say, I'm a convert to gloves. I used to never do it, but now I do it all the time. So when you're eviscerating, you wanna avoid rupturing the rumen or the intestines. You don't want those microorganisms and those flavors in your meat. But like I said, I don't think I've ever detected that. And usually it would be only on the tenderloins. And I've, I've, I've gutted animals where they've been uh, contaminated with uh, visceral contents and wash them good, trim them good, and they're okay. But well, from still, my perspective, it, that's the process that you take your time on, right? Don't, that's a part of the process you don't rush take care of your knife where that point is uh, you can move in a, a quick manner but just being cautious to not go too deep with the knife or to rupture that as you're talking and it's just there's time to take care through that process and it, yeah. it makes a difference it's just like everything the more practice you have the better you are at it um, sometimes i got something for my buddies if it's getting dark because I know where anatomically where things are, I can get it out pretty quick and then we don't have to use our headlamps so much, but yeah. And you know, oftentimes you don't rupture it with your knife, but it's been ruptured by the killing shot mm -hmm. or all the shots. So yep. yeah. And something I want to point out is uh, evidence of sex. Um, in most states, that I've hunted in, you need to leave evidence of sex if you don't leave that head attached and bring out the whole carcass. With antelope, you know, usually where I hunt antelope, I can put them in my pickup. But where I hunt elk, it doesn't happen. So they're usually quartered. So I leave evidence of sex on each hind quarter. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's a cow. Um, and I wouldn't recommend doing what I'm doing here. I'm cutting right down through the uh, udder of that cow and you can see that she's lactating and the milk's coming off and in, in a kill floor USDA an inspector would say that milk is a contaminant. So I would usually go around the side and if I didn't need if I was going to leave it intact and I didn't need to leave evidence of sex I would take the whole udder off and I wouldn't have any milk uh, spilling on the carcass. But in this case I wanted to demonstrate that we leave a little bit of that udder on each side of the carcass uh, for evidence of sex, a little bit of mammary tissue, because it's gonna be uh, completely uh, boned out. Um, this is a testicle on a bull. So you can, if you cut down the midline of the scrotum, you can leave a testicle attached to each side. Then you have evidence of sex on each hind quarter, which is usually all that you really need. This is one of my former students down here with a nice little bull that she shot. I say little because I wish I had that hanging in my house, but um, uh, she weighed about 100 pounds and she shot this huge bull. And of course, she texted me pictures to make me jealous, but. <laughs> That's what so students are is, for, Worry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'd have done. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is another bull on this tarp that I pretty much set I and mean, we brought the tarp to take pictures, but I would usually use the hide, but I pretty much set this out to show how I would prepare it to pack it out. Uh, I, might, I might just quarter it and not bone out the loins, um, but it just depends on the situation, okay? So this is, this is a hind quarter, this is a hind quarter, you can see the ball there of the femur on both of these. And this was a big bull, these are heavy. So if you're gonna put them on a horse and put the whole quarter on a horse, not a pretty big horse, but I wouldn't probably wanna go real far with that without cutting it down a little more. This, this is a front quarter over here that's not been boned and over here. And then these are the back straps or the loin and some of the other meat off the ribs and different places that uh, I've got laying here. And I think these look like tenderloins right here. So that's everything that I would want to take out. Maybe I'd leave some of that bone if I was trying to pack it on my back. 
So generally when I start, I open it from the jaw all the way down to the pelvic bone or the H bone. And I may do it in stages. And sometimes when people watch me, they say, well, you're, I'm just cutting through the hide. And that's what we do in a, in a meat plant. We cut through the hide and we skin it before we eviscerate it. And I've found that when you're field dressing deer, antelope, elk, if you just cut through the hide first, that hide will kind of peel back a little ways. Mm -hmm. And then you're less apt to get a bunch of hair in there when you cut through the body wall. So I, I typically, unless I'm in a, in a hurry, I typically cut through the hide. It pulls back a little bit, then cut through the body wall. And I, I get less hair on my meat that way, which hair really irritates my wife. So I have to be really careful to have clean meat when I get it home. <laughs> I think she's watching, so I said that for her. <laughs> um, and we op I open it from the neck all the way to the pelvic bone, so I get better cooling. And pretty much I skin everything, uh, except when I go antelope hunting, I usually shoot an antelope during the day, and I'm home that night. So I leave the hide on. It stays cleaner. It's not cooling that great, but uh, where I hunt, I hunt on a ranch, and I can hose it down with the garden hose and get it started cooling off good. And then when I get home that night, hang it up, I skin it. Well, and in those situations, may it be deer or antelope, at least my past experience, you sometimes have the opportunity to be next to ice too. So you could put some ice chests in the cavity while you're transporting, even though you don't have the hide off, you get some cooling effect that way until you get yeah. home and can take care of it. But like you said, if you're far back in the country or far away from a pickup, you don't have that option. Right. And sometimes you have snow. So right. You can make a few snowballs and throw in there and sometimes that helps a little bit. Right. You don't want to pack the cavity with snow. That kind of will insulate it like a snow cave kind of, but right. Mm -hmm. So here we are back with this cow and showing a little bit about how to field dress. And uh, you can see that I've, I cut the hide and you can see how far it pulled back just naturally. I didn't do anything. I didn't cut any more hide off. I just went and cut the hide and it pulled back away from that, that cut mark. And so we've got uh, you know the clean meat here to work with and I don't get that hair in, in the carcass. And what I like to do is leave, I cut the hide all the way, but I left the abdominal cavity here intact until I get the, the brisket cut open with that little saw. I used that little hand saw I showed you earlier and cut that open, cut all the way down to the chin and so I can grab the esophagus and the trachea, pull it back, loosen the lungs, and, but before I do that, I'll open up this cavity. So here you see, I'm opening that up and I've got my knife between my two fingers, my index finger and my middle finger. And I can pull the body cavity up and feel the viscera and make sure that my knife tip doesn't get into that. And they make these gutting knives and hook knives and things and I've seen those. Uh, I, I don't have one. I, I do it this way. It works well for me. Um, this is the traditional gut knife, right, Ori? Yeah, this is my little four inch uh, buck knife that I use. So it's gutted a lot of animals, mostly my buddies, not mine, but. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, we, what I did here, you can see a little bit of mammary tissue on, on each side of this this cow and I did that to leave evidence of sex. And as we go cut back through here, I'll cut right to the pelvic bone. And we're gonna wanna, when we get down here, you're, you'll see that I've bunged the animal. You can bung it and, or you can cut through the pelvic bone and bung it. I usually try to bung it. Sometimes if it's big and it's laying uphill and you can't do that, then you can cut through the pelvic bone and then get that bung out that way. And when you're talking about bunging it, it's like coring that the the large intestine at the anus right and trying to get that loose so it comes out yeah and if you think about making a circle with your hands and that's the bung cavity a little smaller in game but that's about how big it is in beef and then you make sure you keep your knife tip towards the outside of the cavity 
And if you can pull a little bit on the bung, and I don't have a meat hook, but you would have one in a, in a processing facility, keep your knife to the outside. You're less apt to cut the bung and get, get those uh, feces on your carcass. Yeah. But if you loosen that first, before you start all this, then, then I think it's a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. So once you open up, and you can see here again how the hide has pulled far away from my line that I want to cut. So I'm not getting any hair in there. And then if we go down to the lower left corner, here, here's the trachea, and we're pulling that out, and we'll take the lungs out. You might have to cut them a little bit loose from there. And there's a little bit of blood in these lungs, and that was a little bit of a lung shot. This is the diaphragm, and you're not gonna be able to pull it back through the diaphragm unless you cut around the diaphragm at the body wall. And so. I do that and be careful that you don't cut the gut. Laying right up against the diaphragm is gonna be the liver. If you wanna eat the liver, you wanna take that out and get the gallbladder off and, and let that start to cool. And then we keep pulling this back and you can see there's, there's nothing up here. I've got it all back here. And this is my preferred method depending on topography, uh, Jeremiah, like you said, is pull it out the side at the flank but you gotta have it loose down here at the bung so you can pull that out the side too. And here's the liver and a lung and the rumen and large and small intestines are in here and we're pulling all that out to the side. And there's a lot of blood in there. That's what killed the animal, that in, internal bleeding. All, so once I thing. get all that out, all I, once I get the visceral out, I'll even try and pick up the front legs and get that, if there is blood sitting in the bottom of the cavity and get it to try and yeah. uh, run out as well. I try and get as much out as I can and get it clean at that point. I usually carry too many water bottles. So I usually have one that I can <laughs> rinse out with, rinse it out with a little bit, with a little bit of water, 16 ounces yeah. of water or something. And it, it makes a big difference and it helps start cooling. You yeah. get, you get evaporated cooling. If you can put like my antelope where I use the garden hose to do that a few times and that evaporated cooling is very powerful to get, get things cooling. And you can see here that I've left the feet on. I usually don't. I usually take those off at the hawk and at the knee and there's a trick to doing that and you can do it with your knife. Uh, I see a lot of people using a saw but I've trained all my hunting buddies to do it with their knife and they're pretty good at it. Again, it's one of those things that when you learn how to do it and then it's uh, repetitive, If once you do it multiple times, it gets a whole lot easier. That's right. And, and the problem with practicing on game is you only get to practice one time a year. That's <laughs> right. right. So, you know. Probably That's why you go four, hunt with buddies and do theirs, right, Ori? Yeah. <laughs> it takes four or five years to get so you can bone out your carcass so it meets my specifications, uh, Jeremiah. Oh, okay. <laughs> The only time I wouldn't immediately field dress is when you could transport that carcass somewhere and you could uh, do it in a nicer place or, you know, someplace else. And I've done that a few times, but not very many. Usually I field dress it right where the animal dies. Um, when you mount, an a when you want to mount the head of an animal, then you need to cape it. So this is that big bull we saw a little earlier and he was a big mature bull and i you can see i haven't gutted it yet he's he's getting a little bit warm in the sun so that rumen is expanding with gas from the microbial activity and uh one serious mistake that most people make when they want to cape an animal is they don't come back far enough okay so you want to come back past the shoulder and most people come to the front of the shoulder and the taxidermist skits it and he goes, it's too short. I got to have some to go all the way down the neck and they get to the, where that neck starts to come into the shoulder. Then they got to wrap it around the mount. And if you don't, if you leave too much, they just trim it off. If you don't have enough, you can't use it. And I've seen that happen with some friends of mine with nice, nice mounts, but they didn't bring enough fly back. So bring more than you need. But what we do here is cut along the midline in the back of the neck. 
because that's where they want to sew it back together up against the wall, not down where people are looking at it. And I'll tell you that this hide right here on the back of this bull's neck was approximately a half an inch thick. And I had, uh, th this knife is called a lambskinner, and I had it from uh, the UW Meat Lab. It was very sharp, and it was hard to cut through that thick hide. So you need to be prepared if you're going to do this. And then what I'm doing here is removing the head at the atlas axis joint. So right at the base of the skull, remove that head. And I'd recommend if you've never skinned out a head for a mount, let the taxidermist do it. Because if you haven't gone around the eyes and made sure you got all the eyelids and the lips and the ears, you're going to mess it up. And if you practice and you think you can do it, that's fine. It's less to pack out that way. These heads are heavy. These big bull heads are heavy. But if you're, if you're not experienced at doing this part of it, and I'm not, because I, I know I'm not a, a trophy hunter, um, then you probably want to let the pro do it. But you get this and you end up with a cape and this hide has gone clear back past the shoulder and the head, I've let, I'll let somebody else do that. And this is the cape that you would have then to pack out. You might notice here that the tag is tied on to the antler. And before you leave the kill, you have to have the tag on. So I don't forget, that's the first thing I do is I tag it and then I start working on it. Okay, so we want to chill rapidly. And in a processing plant, you know, it might take 30 minutes to, to get a beef into the cooler. So it's cooling in 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And in the field, if we could do that, that'd be awesome. Most people don't drive around pulling a cooler behind them that they can hang their their deer, their elk in. Um, so we have to do in the field the best we can. Uh, in a plant, you would, you know, you would chill it less than 40 degrees within four, with, to within 24 to 48 hours. And I can tell you that a big, uh, you know, a beef carcass, the internal temperature of the round will stay above 40 for 36 to 48 hours. And they, most plants won't cut, start cutting the meat unless it's below 50. And again, as Jennifer stated, that's for microbial control. We, we, if you start cutting it warm, you're contaminating it warm and it's gonna grow while it's warm. And sometimes you wanna hot bone something so you can put it in your pack and take a load down the mountain. And then especially um, if you're bow hunting, and you, or if you're in bear country, you got to get the meat away or you won't have any. Uh, but be prepared if you're doing that, like to get it out. But practically, if you, can, if you can cool it below 50 within 24 to 48 hours, you probably won't have any issues with the spoiling of the meat. And that, you know, when it's warm, that's hard to do. When it's cool, usually I hunt in October, November, it's not much of a problem if you skin it. Right, depends on that ambient temperature, what the weather patterns are, right? So we had that freeze two days ago, that had been a perfect time to have an animal down, but two days before that, it was 101 here, up here in the Bighorn Basin, and that just would have been brutal to try and cool any. Yeah, I don't know how you would have managed that, and unless you could throw it in your pickup and get it to a meat plant that has a cooler, skinned and hung up, you know, within a couple hours, that would be ideal and people do that i mean people hunt antelope take it to processing plant i talked a processor called me well one called yesterday another one called two nights ago and you know they're they're slammed but they're still going to do game so yeah, yeah. well and, and these temperatures once you get that carcass down to that temperature you want to maintain it at that level Correct. so even if you get it home and it's cool then you got it hung up in your wherever you hang that up in the tree or in your garage or shop or carport or whatever you, you want to maintain this temperature or keep it cooler you really would like it to get down to that ideal 40 degrees yeah above 40 you get micro a lot uh, faster microbial growth and some pathogens don't grow below 40 
and some actually die below 40. There's one, Listeria, that can grow below 40. So the colder, the better, um, if you, as long as you don't freeze them. And in, uh, my wife built me a beautiful shop. I hang my game in there. And at night, I open the windows, it cools off, I close them in the morning, and it stays pretty nice and cool in there. It's insulated, and it's pretty good. And I'm a little bit anal about my meat, so I have a thermometer sticking in the round of the antelope. So I look in there every morning like, it's, it's below 50, or it's 43, or boy, it's 56. I'm gonna have to cut it up tonight. You know, that's what I do. Okay. And those are pretty inexpensive, an internal yeah. thermometer. Yeah. Sure. I even take one in hunting in my pack sometimes. And I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, that elk my son shot in the very first slide, he shot it up on the side of a mountain in the afternoon. We gutted it. The flies were horrible, so I didn't skin it. And I put my little light cotton shirt over it to keep the flies from getting in there. We propped it up over a log. The next morning we went up with uh, my son and my buddy and we skinned it and quartered it. And the temperature, I wish we maybe should have people guess what the temperature was, but I'll just tell you, it was 76 degrees in the shoulder, which it was close to losing that elk. So I learned a lesson. Skin it, quarter it, hang it up, and you know, run back down the mountain, get the game bags, go up, put them on, come out in the middle of the night or something. But I'm pretty crazy about clean, cool meat. Yeah. And so part of that would have been because you left the hide on, I would suspect. That hide really insulated those front shoulders and, and retained that heat. And then you, you put that T-shirt over top, and it just didn't allow cooling of the carcass cavity either. So Exactly. Yeah. 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 There's a funny story to that. I'll tell you sometime, but I won't bore everybody here with that. <laughs> so you can wash with cool, clean water. I do that all the time. I carry extra water. And when I'm antelope hunting and close to my pickup, I have probably 10 gallons, you know, two five gallon jugs of water in the pickup, wash everything out good. And, uh, people sometimes think water's not good, but water's great. We use a lot of water in a processing plant. And like we talked about, the evaporated cooling is good. It can wash away some of the microorganisms. You'll never wash all of them away. Uh, I even had a, a buddy who shot a bull a couple of miles from camp, and it was dirty. He, <laughs> we we might have not helped him gut it because it was dark. And we heard the shots. We go, I wonder if that's our buddy. Nah, it's somebody else. Well, it was. <laughs> So it's tough to do a big elk on the side of the hill by yourself and keep it clean, and it wasn't clean. So the Especially next thing we got there, we skinned it, we quartered it. I just took the quarters down and threw them in the creek and washed them and rinsed them off and scrubbed them off. And of course, that's not potable water. It's not water that, that has all kinds of microorganisms in it. Sure. Animals are defecating in there all the time. But at least it cleaned it up and got it cooling good and then we hung it up and the biggest part is the temperature getting that temperature down and then cleaning it off when able right yeah this just reminds you to tag the carcass and uh cut the tag like it's supposed to be don't cut it on your leg i've seen people cut their leg doing this i'm using the, the antler on this or the hoof works good but what works best is a tree stump or something which there aren't any around here but all right, so if you're gonna age the meat, and Jeremiah, we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, you wanna age it at a cool temperature. If you don't age it at a cool temperature, you're gonna get a lot of spoilage, and you're gonna get have to do a lot of trimming, and the product, in my opinion, won't be as good. Uh, so you can age with the skin on. If you're in a cooler and it's cold enough, it keeps, us, keeps the meat from dehydrating, but usually, in order to cool it fast enough, I take the skin off, so the skin's not on there. Um, but, you know, I do know people that have their own coolers and they put their game meat in their cooler, so they, if they want to leave their, the skin on, they probably could. I'm not a fan of aging game. Um, we have this bulletin, uh, UW, 
And these uh, days of aging are based on palatability and tenderness. So if you want optimum tenderness and the least amount of aging for an antelope, that would be three days and deer, sheep, goats, all these things, seven days, and then 14 for the bulls. I've never aged anything 14 days. And, the, and if you look over here, you know, what I recommend is err on the short side of aging because the carcass isn't as clean. It's in the field. You cannot keep it as clean. And if you look at some of uh, meat from our camp, you'll see it's pretty darn clean, but it's still contaminated because it's in the grass and it's hanging in the tree and it's, you know, you just can't keep it as clean. Right. So those microorganisms are going to grow. So these dates, uh, days that you recommend would probably be for the individual that does have their own cooler. They were able to get that meat home fairly in a pretty timely manner, got it washed off with the garden hose and put into their cooler. You could yeah. easily go these kind of days, uh, but most of us don't have that option. Yeah. And, you know, even, even uh, you know, I live in Laramie in October or November, you can hang it up in your shop and it's going to be cool. <laughs> Right. Depending on the year, right? Yeah, but yeah. A little bit. Got to worry about the ambient temperatures. So, if I am hanging it in my shop or in a tree or whatever at my my house, do I want to keep it in the shade? Is direct sunlight a bad thing? It's mostly yeah. temperature driven, but yeah, shade's always good. I have a slide we'll look at in a minute on on cooling that gives some tips on cooling, and shade is one of them. Okay, so I would never age fourteen days. And if I was, I would cut up the shoulders or wherever that shot placement was sooner because they're going to have a lot of microbial growth there where that's grossly contaminated. You've broken down some of the tissues and there's lots of substrate for the microorganisms to grow. So at least process that area quickly and then maybe leave the hindquarters longer if, if you wanted to do something like that. Great. So the reason we want things cool is because these pathogenic organisms, uh, they, they, they grow faster above 40 and they grow more rapidly around gunshot areas. So we just talked about that. You want to get those areas kind of cleaned up first. So this is, this is the trick right here. Inadequate cooling of the carcass is the most common cause of spoiled inedible game meat. And I have seen spoiled and edible game meat. And I've, I used to teach a class on game meat processing and students would bring their meat in. And uh, one student brought a big old, I think it was a cow, beautiful cow elk in, but it had been hanging in his grog. He shot it up in Jackson. It was whole, Oof. it wasn't skinned. It was a week or two old it was green <laughs> you mm. couldn't you couldn't eat it the whole thing was no good and it's sad to me it's sad to see because i enjoy game meat so yeah. you got to get it cool if daytime temperatures are above 60 or 70 degrees you're going to have problems if you don't have frost at night you're going to have problems you've got to get it in small pieces and coolers with ice and this is a something you got to realize you need like twice as much ice as meat people don't realize that because you've got to get all that heat out and then keep it cold or get it to a cooler and get it, get it chilled. Um, it's just impossible when it's warm to, and warm at night to get your carcass cooled. Um, this is a, uh, I think this is a bull that was shot in Russia actually, but I thought it was kind of a cool <laughs> picture. I'm not sure. It looks a place like I hunt, so I don't know, but cold water is your friend. Snow can be your friend. Ice uh, with a, you know, a cooler, you can put meat in a cooler, lots of ice. Uh, you can use a tarp to make kind of a cooler, but like you were saying, Jeremiah, you don't want it in the sun because then you'll make an oven. <laughs> so you can, if you can keep some ice inside and tarp insulate a little bit in the shade, that might help it. Dry ice can, can uh, work. Uh, 
got to wrap it up to prevent de uh, dehydration of the meat. And you don't no. want to put dry ice in the car with you because that's a no-no. So you want to wrap the meat and put the, de the dry ice in that cooler with that meat? or I would wrap the dry ice and leave the get... meat unwrapped so that the heat can escape a little bit better. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you can allow air circulation, that helps a lot. So if you hang up your meat, that's ideal. If you prop it over a log, that's better than laying on the ground. If you split it and or quarter it and skin it and hang it up, that's about all you can do to get it to cool, except take it to a cooler. So these, these outquarters here, uh, they cooled out very nicely because this is the evening when they're back at camp, that elk was shot earlier in the day, and then one guy went back and got the horses, or actually mules in this case, and the, uh, the rest of us took care of it and quartered it, hung it up, cooled out nicely, and it was cold, free, freezing every night, so kept in the shade. That was a good product. Please don't do this. <laughs> you know, I, I know that everybody on here doesn't do this, right? <laughs> but, you know, this guy, this guy with the car, he's really proud of that bull, and I would be too, but I wouldn't put it on top of my little plastic car and drive down the road with it. <laughs> Okay. It's because it wouldn't fit in the car, Worry. Well, I understand, but I, I think you need to be prepared. And plus, this is not cooling. I'm telling you, I don't know how they got it up there. That would right? be a trick. There's a couple of two-by-eights under it, but I, mean, I, I don't know. And this guy riding through town, this would be a trick. That guy actually can ride a bike, I'd say. A good but, balance. Uh, white tail yeah. on his back. Uh, we, you know, be a little bit, uh, I think, sensitive to what other people might think about stuff and I think that'll help us in the long run. So this is a big deer my buddy shot on the side of a sunny side of a hill, the south facing slope of a hill. Shade and Jeremiah you talked about shade. So actually he gave me this deer. He had it mounted. He kept it for about 10 years. It's hanging in my house. I think it's so beautiful because the tips of the of the antlers come almost touch it. it's one of those oval racks it's very pretty nice heavy very big was a big deer but we we uh we caped this out and we went behind the shoulder like like we said caped it out and then we quartered the deer and we packed it down well actually we cut it in half and we packed it down this hill to the bottom and hung it up in the shade by a little stream so it was cooler if we'd have left it on this hillside that, that wouldn't have started the cooling process. Then we walked back to camp, several miles back to camp, got a horse, came back, put it on and brought it back to camp and kept it in the shade. But just starting that cooling process in the shade helped, helped this be an edible product instead of leaving it there on the hillside in the sun. So that cooling process really just needs to start as soon as possible. Absolutely. whatever the scenario is and yeah. and i think your slide earlier of the transportation you need to be cognizant of the cooling during transportation some of us might be two hours four hours or more away from home and so during that whole trip you need to make sure and be conscious of that cooling as well that's correct yeah cooling is the most important thing i mean shot placement be safe of course shot placement and cooling okay you get those three and you, you're going to have nice product Okay, if you put meat in a refrigerator, you have to be really careful because a refrigerator, a, a home frig refrigerator is not meant to cool things, actually. It's meant just to keep things cold. And if you just stuff all your meat in a refrigerator, it'll rot if it's warm. So you got to be careful and load it so there's air and so it's not overloaded. And even a freezer, if you're going to put it in a, when you, process it and you have meat wrapped meat and i've seen people and heard of people they process all their elk like four elk and they put it all in one freezer and it's stuffed packed full of meat you have to throw the freezer away because the meat will rot you will never get that smell out of your freezer so put half an elk in the freezer and freeze it then put the other half in the next night or something because it's not it doesn't have the capacity to cool that much meat. right 
Of course, commercial coolers are, de are designed much differently. They have more, they're able to take more BTUs out of the heat out of the product, and you can do that in the commercial freezer or commercial cooler. So eviscerate promptly. Uh, this is being, we're skinning this buck so that he can cool. He's about two hours old when he was brought in here. Um, open the entire carcass from the chin all the way back and uh, prop the carcass open, hang it if you can, quarter it, skin it, and, and you'll have a better product. Now, under most conditions, in my opinion, it's better to let the carcass uh, hang 12 to 24 hours before you cut it. Because you want, and I want the meat to go into rigor even before I, I quarter it, but I can't always do that in the field. I usually end up, if an elk skinning, quartering, hanging it up, and you'll get some real muscle shortening in the back strap when you do that, but it's better to have it cool than not cool fast enough. Um, and then sometimes you want to bone the carcass out. This is that same cow we looked at. The hindquarters are off. Uh, most of the meat is taken off the ribs cage. I didn't cut through every rib and take it. This is a very thin piece of meat here because it was a little contaminated inside. So I don't, I don't do that, but I get almost all the meat off. I've taken the meat off the neck and the shoulders are over here on the tarp and I'll bone all that out um, and do muscle boning of the whole entire carcass. So skinning, the most important thing is skinning allows the carcass to cool much faster. And if you think about the hide and the hair, it's very insulated, extremely good at insulating that animal in the cold. It's extremely good at keeping the heat in, and that's not what we want. We want to get the heat out. So I usually err on the side of skinning and have a little more dehydration than not cooling fast enough. Sometimes if it's really cold, you can get some toughening. If the meat gets cold before it's in rigor and it freezes before rigor, we call that cold shortening. And I know a couple guys, that sh uh, one guy shot a big bull moose and the other guy was a meat scientist, like we gotta skin this thing, get it cold. He like up by Jackson got like 25 below that night. The oh. moose was hard as a rock and it was tough. Now it might've been a little tough because it was a big bull, but it was also tough because everything shortened on the carcass. That's interesting. Yeah, that doesn't usually happen, but it can happen. I would say a large carcass, you just skin it. And it, they're just almost impossible to cool it without skinning it. And I would, I would usually split it and quarter it too. Well, and the larger the animal you get, like an elk and a moose, the thicker that hide is. And so yep. the tougher it is to get cooling through that hide. And I, yeah, that's been my experience too. And on moose, sometimes you want to actually open up the shoulder and let it flop back so you can get cooling inside there, even when you skin it and quarter it, because they're just massive. And yeah. you just too, too much volume to get cooled fast enough, uh, even, in a, even in a commercial cooler. So, and the guard hairs on the moose, some of them are, I mean, they're eight inches long. They're, they're they're, you're not going to get any heat out of there. On no. that side. So we I got to be a meat packer on a moose trip once. Yeah, I mean, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That's why he's only done it once. <laughs> yeah. I bet you didn't. I bet you didn't uh, pack a quarter. <laughs> I, I, well, I did. Uh, I oh, was oh, a little <laughs> Even moose quarter, a, a full-grown moose quarters on a horse, you might overload your horse. You need to it, be careful. I think it was. It was pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah. I've only done it once. I'm not going to volunteer to do it again. <laughs> yeah. That's when you just look at it and go, yep, that's a nice one. Yeah. Go back and get some bottle of water. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a, another really nice deer. Again, I didn't shoot this deer. But what we're doing is just demonstrating we're skinning it. And this deer uh, was shot up on a ridge and was not skinned or gutted, but we drug it down off that ridge to the bottom where we could get a pickup and then we gutted it and we left the hide on and we put it in the pickup and we drove back to the to the ranch 
and then hung it up in the shop and skinned it. But it only took a couple hours to, to get it there and start then start the cooling process. But it stayed a lot cleaner that way. You know, and usually where I hunt deer and elk, that's not an opportunity. So I skin it right away. So it just depends on your situation, really. Yep, but, it does. And it's a balancing act, right? Clean versus cooling. But yep. cooling's always going to win out if, if you win. don't have this option. Yeah. And, you know, you get – there wasn't any trees around where this buck was shot, but you get pretty inventive about it when you skin it and it lays on the hide and you use the hide as your table. You can keep generally keep things pretty clean and then hang it up and not drag it through the pine cones and stuff. You can, you can keep it clean. All right, that's, that's all of my slides. And I don't know if we have any questions, but uh, be happy to answer any questions. No, oh, this was fantastic, Worry. Um, no, I think you've covered most of what I was thinking of. Do you have any questions, Jeff or Jenny? I do not, Worry. Thank you for being here with us today. That was yeah. awesome. It kind of gets me in the mood to go to the mountains. Right? It's own. a little rough today to be at work now. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, I guess one question I have. So let's say you got that carcass and it, maybe you broke it into quarters or maybe you got the whole deer back to the shop. It's skinned, it's cooled, it's hung up, and you're ready to process. Do I want to try and keep that cooled and then break those cuts down before I wrap it and freeze it? Or can I freeze those smaller parts, thaw them out later, and then – finish my process just as we were talking before the show you know a lot of times we get home and then we got to get back to work and then next weekend I have to get to it do you yeah. have any thoughts on that I I never freeze it before I cut it and wrap it uh you could you just want to be careful when you thought that it doesn't get too warm and you always lose moisture in a freeze saw type, type cycle um you're going to lose that moisture when you cook it anyway, probably. But um, I think it's better just to keep it cold and then cut it up and then freeze it. That would be my recommendation. Great. And I, I want to say a few things about cookery. Uh, just not too many days ago, I had some company and we, I had some couple, I shot a couple doe antelope last year. And I took those sirloin tips, which are the same muscle, the quadriceps, as on a beef. And I had four of them, and I dry rubbed them with a roast rub that I made. And I put them on my barbecue grill, and I smoked them with apple wood slowly and kept them indirect heat. So I didn't turn on the back burners where the meat was. Cooked them slow, and they were pretty darn good. Yeah, dry rub, applewood smoke, slow cooked, antelope, quadriceps. Making me want to come over to your house to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we supper, Rory. <laughs> That's the other benefit of having a friend that is a meat scientist as well. <laughs> After hunting is the 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 enjoyment of the, the meat. Prep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if any of my anybody I know or I see somebody cutting down an apple tree, I'm like, hey, can I have that? <laughs> <laughs> Because we don't grow many around here in Laramie. I have a use for that. <laughs> yeah. And it's a stronger smoke flavor than uh, a pecan would be a nice mild smoke flavor. They use we that. We really don't of, have any of those around here. <laughs> no. I bought this at a hardware store. A bag of it. But it's what they use mostly in a barbecue contests because it doesn't overwhelm the intricate flavors of their rub. And, injections and stuff that they do so yeah and then i have another tip on fabricating that i'd like to relay to people when i have a back strap and i use in antelope for instance i just cut them hanging up so i bone them out muscle bone them hanging up and i have a back strap i don't cut it into steaks i leave it as a loin section and then that, that loin section, I should stop sharing so that, that, that loin section, uh, I can cut into steaks when I'm ready to cook it, or I can throw it on the grill and cook it as a roast kind of, and it'll stay a little more juicy. Mm -hmm. uh, during the winter when I cook antelope loin, I, I get a frying pan and I melt some butter in it and I 
I put some garlic, salt, and pepper on it, and I cook it under pretty high heat. And if you watch these cooking shows, they're using a lot more BTUs of heat than we ever use at home. So crank it up, you kind of cook it from the outside. And then when it's probably 125, 130 on the inside, I cut it into thick steaks and then I flop it over and I finish cooking it the rest of the way to about 150 and then it's not so dried out it's it's a little better product you keep some good. of that moisture in there as yep. before you you process yeah. and cut and, most people yeah. you know you see they cut quarter inch steaks and they cook the bejeebers out of them and they're like wow this thing's dry and tough uh, yeah that's why they don't like antelope and deer and and wild game for yeah. the part most of it right yeah you know so after after this is, after this discussion i'm thinking what am I having for lunch today? <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't bring any. I should have brought a piece of that sirloin dip to eat today. So the one we got a question for you, Warry, is flop a good cooking term? <laughs> is what? Flop a good cooking flop. term. <laughs> well, did I say that? Flop it on the grill? Yeah, you just flop it over in that butter. And <laughs> yeah, that is for me. <laughs> That's kind of how it goes, right? Yeah. Well, with that, Ori, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your time. What, what great information and knowledge, and, and what a perfect time of year to be offering this information. Again, thank you so much. And with that, we'll just wrap this show up. And let, me, all... let, me, let me do one thing, Jeremiah. Let me, yeah. let me share my screen again. And I want to I want to talk just briefly about some uh, resources that we have at the University of Wyoming Extension Perfect. Perfect. and some UW game publications. And one of my former students sent me this picture. You can see the sidewalk and the road. This is uh, up in northern. What's the north Mammoth Hot Springs? Mammoth, Mammoth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> out his window of his office, and he said. When, when it's breeding season, you need to be kind of careful about walking out through here. Go the other way, walk around. So, yeah. So elk are not strangers to those people in, in Mammoth. But we have these resources available, and uh, we can uh, share those somehow with, with folks. They're all available online now, and they – some of the pictures, some of these are old, I should up, you know, upgrade the pictures, but they kind of give you a good idea about skinning, boning, meat care, uh, some of the information I got out of here, uh, other information from experience and others from science, you know, so there's a lot of uh, information available that people can kind of draw on. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Warrior. And yeah, we do have a vessel for that. So uh, with that, uh, we have the Barnyards and Backyards website. And Jenny will probably show that up here in a little bit. And we, we record these shows and post those back up on that website so people can refer to them later. On that website, we also have a link that we highlight those types of resources on there. So we'll make sure to get those up there for, for everyone and that. Um, if you wanna see our future shows, that schedule's up there as well. You wanna see past shows, wanna share those out, watch this one again, that's where those will be. Uh, if you wanna get uh, connected with those resources as well, by all means, reach out to your local extension office. We have a, an extension office in every county and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation, and they'd be more than willing to connect you to those publications and those resources, or connect you down to campus with Worry Means or Cody Gifford, our meat science, uh, or our animal science department, or any of our specialists, and that's, that's the beauty of extension. We're here to connect you to resources to help you. The last thing, and, and as always, we do this program for, for you, and so we want to hear back from you. We need an evaluation of how we're doing with this show, what you'd like to see. Um, so for those of you on Facebook Live, uh, Jenny has put a link into the, the comments section here on Zoom. She put it in the chat box, and then also once you close out of Zoom, it, you'll be prompted in a URL. And it's a very simple five-question evaluation. If you just take two, two minutes of your time, fill that out for us, we'd really appreciate it. But with that, I just want to say thank you very much again, Maury, so much for your time. Thank you, Jeff and Jenny and all our participants for joining us. You guys have a great rest of your Friday and a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Maury. Thank Enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody.